Okay. Well, I want to welcome everybody to day two of our um, ITC beginner um, redesign training. Um, for those of you that um, don't know me, um, I thought I'd take a, just a second to introduce myself. Um, I'm Lori Nye. Um, I've been, um, you know, with um, school software, so to speak, um, for several years. Um, in 1998, I started out with state software. Um, I was with them on the fiscal side of things for um, 10 years. And then I left there to go to a district. Um, and I was the uh, assistant treasurer for a local district for 10 years. And then um, more recently, um, I came back to state software um, slash Nawaka um, in 2018. And then um, at the start of this um, year, calendar year, I am rejoined with the SSDT team, um, again, on the fiscal side. So, um, you know, you, we may have crossed paths um, if you've been <laughs> around for a little while. Um, I see Carol. Carol, I remember, you know, we go way back. Um, but those of you that don't know me, I wanted to give you a little background as to, um, you know, who I am, where I came from, and so forth. So today we're going to focus on um, the payroll processing side of things. So yesterday, um, Andrea, um, she focused on an overview, kind of the look and feel of things. Um, today, we're going to focus on the actual payroll process itself. So I wanted to point out where you can find some helpful information um, when it comes to the payroll process. Um, so like always, if you go to SSDT's wiki page, um, we have put together under our SSDT meetings and trainings. Um, there's uh, a section called ITC only training, I'm sorry, training materials, my bad. Um, and then we want the ITC overview beginning training. So this is going to give you basically um, everything that we've talked about um, in the three days of beginner training. So um, we've broken it down by day. So day one, day two, and day three, sorry for all the scrolling. And then we've linked then um, some supporting information, our agenda for today. There's a PowerPoint um, that kind of coincides with the training that, that we were doing um, each, of, each day. Um, so I can give you a feel for what that looks like. Um, again, we've broken it down by day. I'm not going to use this um, per se as we go through the process um, this morning, but you can use this um, hopefully with, you know, training your districts and you can use this as um, a tool um, to help pass information on um, as you do similar presentations. So Again, we've broken this down by day. Um, so day one, day two, day three. So there is a PowerPoint that um, we hope you find helpful. And then obviously our user um, manuals and our appendixes um, for the actual documentation that comes packaged with the software. Um, going back then to the wiki. I also wanted to point out um, in the documentation, if you go down to the appendix, under the checklist option, we have um, just a sample payroll checklist. So this is just something that you know you can use as a start um, for when you're training, you know, putting together a checklist for your own districts. Um, I, you've probably all um, noticed that as districts are migrating, um, they all have their own checklist um, that's district specific. 
And I know a lot of times it's helpful um, to get those checklists from them ahead of time. You can kind of look over those checklists, compare it to maybe this one that we have as a sample um, or something that you have in place already at your ITC. And then you can tailor that towards um, you know, your specific district that you're working with, you know, make it their own, tweak it, um, and so forth. So again, this is just a sample um, that you can use to start or use, you know, in your trainings. Um, but I did want to point out that that is available under the appendix um, in the checklist section. Okay. All right. We are going to then get started in the payroll process. So uh, again, as I mentioned, you're gonna find that districts, you know, they process things so differently. Um, you know, we still have to start at point A and get to point Z, but everything in between can be so, so different. So we're gonna give you, you know, how the process can work. And then again, probably you'll have to tweak it a little bit, um, you know, to make it, um, work specifically exactly how that the district that you're working with um, needs it to. The very first thing I wanted to point out was up in the right hand corner. So you're always going to want to make sure that the district, you know, is working in the month um, that is current. So this is your current posting period. So currently we're processing in the month of March. So, um, you know, the, the software does offer some flexibility in the fact that you can be posting records um, with an open posting period, but you're not going to be able to post a payroll with a date that is outside of this current month. Okay, so the first thing, you know, the district is going to want to make sure that they have current is you know, the month that they're working in or processing in. So again, to change the posting period, um, they would go to core and then posting period. The current posting period is always in green. So whatever is highlighted in green is gonna be your current month in the upper right hand corner. And then again, as you probably already know, there are um, actually three different types of posting periods, closed, open and current. So you can use this grid then and the columns to help us, you know, know, okay, the month of March, year 2022, it is open and it's current, okay? So you can leave months um, open, um, but you can only ever have one current posting period. Um, Again, just a word of caution about leaving months open. Um, when you close the month, that triggers those month end report bundles um, to be copied out to the file archive. So as you can see in our sample, this is probably not the best practice, okay? When the district is done with a month, they, are going to, they will want to close this. That triggers those month end reports to be copied out to the file archive. Um, uh, where we find there being an issue is um, at fiscal year end. So you leave June open because you're not quite done with closing the fiscal year, um, which is fine. Um, you can start processing in July, but once you're truly done with June, um, you want to make sure that that month is closed. Um, auditors come, you know, into the districts and they want um, benefit balance reports at the end of the fiscal year. This is one area where um, we found that, you know, it is hard to get a true picture of what those benefit balances were at the end of the fiscal year if they don't close the month um, of the fiscal year, you know, meaning the month of June on a, in a timely manner. So if I went in and I closed all of these months at once, all of my file archive reports are going to look the exact same as of today. Okay. Hey, Lori, I have a question about that. Sure. Because um, we have a lot of districts that are on a two-week delay. Uh -huh. 
So they need to leave the previous month open so they can get their transactions posted sure. for absence and attendance. <laughs> Excuse me, absence and attendance. So do you recommend after they complete their last payroll of that month to go ahead and close it just to generate those reports and then reopen it so they can get their attendance and absences posted for the next month's payroll? So if, you know, I, I, understand exactly, I understand exactly what you're saying. So, you know, the month end can mean different things to different people or to different districts based on how they're processing. So do they want those absences and, and attendances to be included in that month end report bundle? If they do, then they want to wait to, to generate that, you know, close that month so that those are included. So it's okay. kind of a timing thing. Um, okay. You know, if they close the month, that's going to fire one report set of reports. If they open it back up and then they close it again, that's going to fire another set of reports and copy those out there as well. Right, right. Okay. okay. So it, I, I, I totally understand what you're saying. And it truly is, you know, a timing district specific kind of practice you know there's no right or wrong there's no you know you have to do it this way um i guess that's the beauty of you know the flexibility of the software um but you know they just want to be conscious of where they're at in their processing how they want those reports to look and then you know close the month accordingly i guess okay got it okay thank you sure at any time, please feel free to ask any questions. Um, you know, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat, but um, I'm not the best at doing that. I just start talking and get, you know, focused in what I'm talking about. So please interrupt me at any time. It's, it's totally fine. Okay, so, you know, posting periods are important, obviously. Um, the next thing that I wanted to point out is um, account synchronization. So if you go to USAS integration, um, account synchronization. This process is what um, allows the communication between payroll and USAS um, when it comes to accounts. So no longer can we add accounts on the payroll side like we used to be able to if um, the USP con flag was set um, accordingly. Um, we don't have that ability um, in the redesign any longer. So the account always has to exist on the USAS side, and then payroll can use that account in, in, in its charging. Okay, so if um, USAS has added an account, you know, throughout the day, and payroll now wants to use that, we, that's one time and probably the only time you would have to go to USAS integration, um, account synchronization, and then we're going to click on the account, um, synchronize accounts with USAS. So that goes out and it makes that connection with the USAS side, and then it's going to update then all of the accounts, um, you know, pulling all those accounts and allow the payroll side to use them. Um, this process automatically happens every night. So it's an automated process. So it's not something that the user has to go into every single day and before they start payroll, sync their accounts. But if there's an account that payroll needs to use and USAS is just now creating that throughout the day, we're going to want to go in and sync those accounts manually. And now payroll can begin to use them. Okay. One helpful um, tool also under USAS integration is the expenditure accounts option. So I find this helpful for um, A, seeing if the account has been synced with USAS or not. So you can click the um, drop down box and you can, you know, filter your grid by true or false. So you can see, um, you know, what accounts have or have not been synced. I also like to use this to see, hey, does that account even exist on the USAS side? Is it an active account? So if you're working with a district, you know, 
maybe just setting up, you know, a pay account for salary purposes, or you're working with a district to see, you know, what um, benefit account they might be, they're getting an error in their employer distribution. What, what account do they want to be charged? So you can filter this, you know, as you, as you probably are aware by, um, you know, accounts to try to narrow down um, an account you might be looking for. Maybe it's a benefit account. So we're gonna, you know, use the object of two, okay? So just something to keep in mind when you're working with accounts that I think is super helpful instead of, you know, logging into the USAS side and looking at the accounts there. Okay. All right. So now we're going to actually um, get into um, the nitty gritty of the payroll process itself. Um, the, the first thing that districts are probably going to want to do is work on their absences and attendances. So this can happen, you know, multiple ways. Um, a district can manually be entering this information. So um, if they're, you know, needing to add just, you know, a few records, or if they're a district that does enter everything by hand, they can go to core and then attendance. And within um, the attendance option, you have a couple different ways to add um, information. And it's really just a personal preference, I think. Um, one is to click create. Now, just because maybe you have a stack of absences and attendances, um, but it, they're for multiple different employees. Um, the first thing I like to do is I like to drag this grid or this pop-up box all the way to the top. That gives me more room um, below to just keep adding information. So if the district has a stack of absences or attendances, they can actually just start entering um, the information for their first person. Now maybe this employee has multiple records. I can use this copy row option and it's gonna allow me to keep going and then just maybe change the day um, maybe they only used a half of a day, you know, of sick leave or a half a day of personal leave. I can change whatever um, needs to be changed and I can continue going. Now, maybe I have um, a record that I need to add for a different person. I can simply click the plus sign, enter my information for my next employee. And again, I can just keep going. So, you know, maybe this employee only has one record. I'm gonna click the plus sign to keep going and add the next employee in my um, stack of absences or attendances. So that's one way to add um, that information. The other is to click the mass add option. And here um, it allows you to basically use a calendar. So I can enter my employee, um, their position, the length, the type, um, the category, and then I can use this start and stop date range and, and click create, or I can use the calendar down below. Maybe the days are all over the place and they're not consecutive. I can simply enter, you know, an absence for sick day, for a sick day or an attendance, um, you know, and then attendance as a category. And I can click the, all of the different days then on the calendar that pertain to this particular employee. If I click create, then that posts all of those records um, in you know, a couple clicks. Maybe I made a mistake. You do have the clear all dates option and it allows you to start all over. Okay, so it's really a personal preference. I kind of like the calendar. Um, but that doesn't mean everybody does. So, um, you know, again, again, they have a couple different options to manually add attendance information. The other option is to um, use um, some sort of spreadsheet. So maybe they're getting their information from a third party. Um, Frontline um, is a good example. Um, I know a lot of those third parties, if the district is already paying for that service and they're not using, you know, they don't have the extract part set up, 
they are good about working with them, <clears throat> excuse me, to get that um, extract file set up in, a, in, in the right order um, so that it is accepted, you know, um, in the load program in the redesign. So really encourage your districts to, you know, if they're not using that part, but they're paying, already paying for the service, you know, it's, it's a huge time saver um, to work with that third party to get that extract file set up. Um, and then it's easily extracted. And then they're going to go use the under utilities there's an attendance absence import option. So they're gonna save that file in CSV format um, and then browse to find that file. Um, if they don't already have um, like a position number in the file, they can use, um, define the location code, um, the, either the building IRN or the um, building and department. Um, and that is what will be used then um, when the file is posted. Most generally, they're probably, um, this option will be set to none um, because they do have that position number in the file already. And then what's nice is it's not all, you know, all about just posting absences and attendances. They can actually include payment information in the file and then select the option, um, the post to payroll processing option either post for future or current. And then that allows that payment then to be posted um, accordingly, you know, future or current, depending on which option they choose um, and not just the attendance or absence side of things. So it can be two, kind of a twofold um, process. And then down below you have a couple options. Do you wish to combine the attendance records? So say somebody's gone um, or, a, you know, um, you're posting attendance for the same day, but it's a half a day. Do you want those combined into one record or not? So if they do, they would check the box. If they don't, they want to see, you know, they have one um, form for each of those absences or attendances that they'd like to track separately. Um, they could, they would not check the box then. And then again, um, you know, based on districts, um, you know, probably their negotiated agreement, are they allowed to um, have their leave go negative or not? Um, and then do they want the pay account um, that's already assigned to that position charged or would they like the sub for SSN account charged? Okay, most generally they're just posting it automatically to the pay account that's um, set up for that employee. And then they're gonna click import and they're gonna see then, um, you know, all of those records that are included in that file posted. Um, and if there are any errors, there's um, an ATTERR error report that's generated. And then those records they know then they would have to look at specifically, fix those and then reload just those errors. Okay, they're not gonna wanna reload the whole file. So then depending on how they um, answered the prompt above, you know, it, it will actually post those records to future or current, okay? Now, the um, documentation, I'm gonna go to help and then documentation, and I'm gonna go to that specific chapter um, under the utilities menu. This, um, chapter gives you the um, file specs. So if you have uh, you know, a district that you're working with and they don't already have something in place um, with their third party or they're wanting to create something you know, on their own that they can use over and over again, um, these are the, this is the file format, um, the layout that the file needs to be in. Now, in this case, when using this rec this um, option, the placement of the um, the information is important. So, column A always has to be the record indicator, so it has to be set to AA. Um, column B has to be the employee number, and so forth. So, the placement is what is important 
when you're using the absence attendance import option, okay? Column headings are not important. So like when you use um, mass load, you know, column headings have to be specific. They don't have to be in any order. It's the column headings that the system is looking at. In this case, it's sort of the opposite. It's looking at the placement of the, the records and not the column headings at all, okay? So I know some districts have, you know, with their third party, it's easier for them to set, to include the column headings in row one. So they know that, you know, oh, column B is the employee ID. Um, just know that when they go to load that file, they're always going to get at least one error um, because it's not going to be able to load that first row. And that's totally fine. They open the error file. They see that that's, you know, it's airing out on row one and that's okay. All right. Okay. Um, there is the option then, and I'll show you that quick too, um, to use mass load. So if a district is wanting to use mass load to load their attendances and absences, they can do that as well. So in the um, absence attendance chapter, um, it gives you then um, the, uh, the values then that you need included in your load file for mass load. Okay, and as I just mentioned, column headings are important when you use mass load, okay, not the placement of the, the data. Okay, I don't know how common that option is, but I did want to point it out that, you know, it is available for them to use if, if they um, choose to do so. Okay, so after they have their absence and attendance information loaded, then there is um, a report that they'll probably want to run. And that's called, on the, on the homepage, it's called the SSDT Attendance Journal Report. So if I click on that, um, if you go to the Query Options page, it's going to give you the ability to um, enter some start and stop dates. So we probably don't want to leave this open-ended. Um, you're probably going to want, or the, the district would want to enter the dates that apply to the specific pay period that they're working on. Okay, um, they might want to go down to the type and they might want to run this two different times. One for the date range um, using the type of attendance and one um, the date range with the type absence. And that will be the, a way then that they can double check the information that they've just um, posted in the system for this pay period. Okay. All right. So after they have their um, absence and attendance information entered, um, you know, I'm hopeful that most districts were used to using um, up to Cal Future in um, Classic. So in current, they're going to continue doing the same thing. Um, and for those of you that may have districts that are just maybe using current, um, hopefully that's not the case. I'll kind of explain the differences. You know, future, they can be entering exceptions at any time. So if they know they have some supplemental payments that they need to pay, um, you know, in April, and they're not in to, you know, their current processing month, or they're not ready to, to begin working in April yet, they can actually be um, entering those supplemental payments ahead of time. Maybe they have some that are, you know, the end of the, the school year even. Um, they can be posting those now, and they're going to want to use an effective date. And I'll show you that here in a second. So again, you can be using or entering things um, ahead of time, kind of work outside of the current pay period that you're processing. Um, current, obviously, you have to have a payroll initialized, and then you're going to enter all of that information that pertains to that pay period into that payroll. So it can be a little time restrictive. Um, you know, you have to have the payroll initialized. Maybe you're not ready to do that yet. Um, then you start entering all the all your exceptions into current. Um, so 
again, you know, you can kind of be with future, you can be working ahead. Um, another thing is when you use current and you have to delete a payroll um, for whatever reason, maybe you entered a wrong um, pay period date and you have to start over, um, maybe a wrong pay, pay of the month, the pay cycle. Um, you basically lose all of the, that, the, that information that you have entered in current. So any exceptions that you've put into current are gonna be gone the, the, time, the minute you click delete payroll, okay? So future allows a little more of a safeguard um, against losing um, you know, maybe a whole day's worth of work um, so I would really encourage districts to use future. Um, I also think that future screen is a little bit more user friendly um, than current. So uh, again, just a personal preference, but I do, um, you know, encourage, encourage your districts to use future because it, 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 there's lots, you know, there's multiple benefits. Okay, so the options we're going to talk about um, for the basically the rest of the morning are under the option of payroll. So as we talked, there's payroll payments, there's current, and there's also future. So I'm gonna talk about future. So again, this allows you to enter exceptions ahead of time. Um, you, you know, maybe it's a Friday and your payroll isn't until next week, but I'm gonna, you know, be able to start my payroll process by using future and entering all of those exceptions. So you um, first start, you know, by entering the employee name. If they have multiple positions, then it's going to um, populate those under the compensation dropdown. And then you'll pick the appropriate um, compensation you're wanting to add this exception um, to. You can enter a description. So I know like a lot of times, um, districts will enter like the day that the employee subbed so that if they sub multiple days, you're going to see, you know, oh, this was, this entry was for, you know, um, March 5th, March 6th, and so forth. The pay type, um, you know, most generally, it's probably either a miscellaneous um, when you're adding, adding exceptions or a regular. The difference between those two is, do I want this to affect if this is a contracted employee, do I want this to count, you know, towards their contract? Yes or no. Um, is this just something extra that I'm paying them for outside of their contract? Then I want um, to use that miscellaneous payment. You know, I would caution districts to use the regular pay type for a contracted employee. Um, if they have a contract and you post a regular payment against that, First of all, if they're stretch paid, um, you know, it's going to count against the amount paid, which is then going to affect, you know, the, the, their, the payoff amount. So probably um, if they're a contracted employee, we don't want to use the regular pay type. If they don't have an obligation and you're just paying them, you know, um, based on time that's being turned in, then you can use the regular pay type and it's just going to continue to pay them that amount, um, you know, that you're, you're um, including in each pay. So the miscellaneous pay type then is probably the most common for exceptions. I'm not saying, you know, always, but it is the probably the most common. Here's the effective date. So if you're posting um, records in future ahead of time, you can use the effective date. And I am going to quickly go to the future chapter. You're going to, until you get comfortable with dates, um, that's one thing that I, I you know, I'm constantly looking up, um, to be honest, because they do differ from those in classic. So um, the effective date is needs to be with between the um, payroll beginning and ending date. So it's not the pay date. Okay. 
So that's the, the date they're going to want to use um, when it comes to the effective date. Sorry, I just wanted to be sure of myself because again, the dates I'm constantly looking up. So then the units, you know, how many units are you paying them for? Um, one, five, you know, and then the rate is going to automatically populate based on how their compensation is set up. So whatever the compensation is um, for the compensation above that you're paying them on, that rate's automatically going to populate. Now that may not always be the case. Um, so you can also you can enter um, the rate that you're wanting if it's something different. Um, so maybe I want to pay them, you know, an extra hundred dollars. So I would enter one in the units and then the rate of one hundred. Okay. Does this payment apply for retirement? So if it's something like a supplemental payment. Um, you know, you would, you know, make sure that this box is unchecked, um, but by default, it, it is checked for you, okay? If extra retirement hours apply to the payment, um, you can enter those here, and those will be included when you submit your um, SERS per pay or STRS per pay, okay? Um, if this is a supplemental payment, you have the option to tax that differently, um, so you can choose um, that if, you know, the type of payment that you're paying applies. So the, the, the system is automatically going to charge the pay accounts, you know, that the employee has um, set up for this um, position. Um, if it's a miscellaneous payment and you need to charge it, maybe it's a sub and they have multiple you know, specific miscellaneous payment or a pay accounts, I'm sorry, set up, and then you want to charge to a specific building, you can click the plus sign and then change the, um, if it's, you know, percent 100 account, you would enter, change the rate type to percent and then enter the expenditure account and then make sure you, um, in the amount charged, put in 100%, okay? And then leave pro and employer distribution, these boxes are automatically checked. So if that applies to this type of payment and you want that to be included in the distribution, you would leave those checked. Okay, the nice thing about future, sort of like we talked about with the mass ad option um, or create option in attendance, you can actually check this box that says create new. I would enter all of my information for my first um, uh, exception. When I click save, it will keep me in the add mode and allow me to keep entering my exceptions. So instead of clicking save, and then I have to X out, and then I go to create, it opens up a new window. I enter all my information for my next exception. I click save, X out, click create. We can actually stay in this save mode by clicking the create new button. That's gonna keep me here. When I'm done with my last exception, I would click the close box and that's gonna allow me then to, when I save, close the window and the system knows I'm done adding my exceptions. Okay. All right, so that's future. Um, again, you can see we have some information in future already. So the district, you know, they've entered all of their exceptions. Now, how do we know that we balance? Okay, so there's a report from the homepage. It's called SSDT Future Pay Amount Report. So I'm gonna click that. Um, again, um, you know, all the, the basic, you know, report options, you can change the format, um, uh, you know, how you, want the page orientation and so forth. If I click the query options page, um, if a district is using an effective date, maybe they wanna balance all of their supplemental payments that they've entered for you know, the end of the school year. Um, you can use this effective date, beginning and ending date, to actually get a, a, a report then of all the information that they've entered for that group of payments, okay? 
if they're not using the effective date. So they're just basically, um, you know, posting information that's going to apply to the next payroll that they're processing, then we would not want to enter any effective dates here um, to start. And if I click generate report, it's going to give me then a report. And in this case, I just had one employee and I had, you know, four exceptions. They probably have some sort of um, means, maybe they have all their exceptions totaled in a spreadsheet. Maybe they have all of their exceptions, you know, they have a manual tape total. Um, you know, that sounds so old school, but <laughs> that's what I would do. So, um, you know, whatever means they have to, um, you know, balance, you know, the total that they think it should be, we're going to use this report then to compare that to and, and, and you know, get a good report to look at um, as far as if they did charge any specific pay accounts, you know, those would be listed. So it's a good time to check those accounts as well. Okay. So that's the um, SSDT future pay amount report. Um, larger districts, they might be running this and maybe they're only working with certain pay groups um, within the, the treasurer's office. So they can run this um, by pay groups as well. So you could just, they could enter um, the first pay group that, that they are responsible for followed by a comma, and then, you know, all continue and entering all of those groups that apply to just them. So I know larger districts, you know, they like to run, they don't care about everybody else's, um, groups of people, they only care about their own. So they do have a way to run um, and get a good report for just those particular groups as well. Okay. All right. Are there any questions on anything that we've talked about so far? Okay. We're gonna move on then, and we're gonna actually initialize the pay. So we have all of our absence and attendance information entered. Um, we have, and we've balanced that. We have all of our exceptions entered, um, and we've balanced that. So now we're ready to actually start the payroll process. So again, everything is that we're gonna work on um, going forward, for the most part, is gonna be under payroll. Now we're going to go down to payroll processing. So this is a grid that allows you to see um, the payroll that your the district is working on, as well as all imported payrolls. So if they want to see information about, um, you know, a payroll prior to them migrating to the redesign, they can come down to find that pay date. And then they're going to click detail. And this is going to bring up just a few reports um, for them to see. So you're going to notice that as they process payrolls in the redesign, they're and they come back to the details of that payroll, they're going to be given a lot um, more information. So, you know, they, they can see budget reports um, basically, and then they could. Um, regenerate a payment if needed. That's about it. But don't forget about the file archive. So as long as everything, you know, you guys are migrating all of the information from their payroll CD um, into their file archive, which I'm sure you are, then they do have a means to, to look at other information within that payroll that was imported by going to the file archive. Okay, so it's not really ever lost. We'll just, we're just gonna have to go to a different place to, to, to find it. Okay, there is the option to return to the payroll listing. So that's gonna give, bring me back to this main grid and allow me to then see um, everything, you know, all of the payrolls. So you can see, um, here's a test payroll that was completed in the redesign. And you can see, as I mentioned, you're, you're if you go back to those um, details of those payrolls, um, the district is going to be able to see um, mainly, you know, almost all of the um, reports that they see when they initialize the pay, the pay report, the um, deduction pay 
payroll items, excuse me, reports and budget reports. Okay, so let's start a new pay. Um, I'm gonna initialize a new pay. It's gonna prompt you for a payroll description. This is something new to the redesign. I actually think it's, it's really helpful. Um, a lot of districts are using the pay date, so you know they can easily see um, when they go to this um, initialize, um, I'm sorry, when they go to the payroll processing grid, they can look down this description column and they can, they can see then right away, oh, this was for you know March 15th um, and so forth, okay? So I'm just gonna use the description of test. Um, they will want to, just like I and I Cal, they will want to define the pay plan um, bi-weekly, semi-monthly, or monthly. Then the pay cycle, what pay of the month is this? So again, just like classic, the pay of the month is tied to what payroll items are going to be withheld from the employee's checks. So I'm gonna select second pay of the month. I'm gonna enter my pay period dates, my beginning date, my ending date, and then my pay date. The district does have the ability to um, process the payroll um, a little differently if they need to. Um, first of all, they can suppress voluntary deductions. So maybe this is a special pay and they don't want all of the deductions that are normally withheld, um, the uh, voluntary deductions like insurances, um, any annuities, um, those sorts of things um, withheld from this special pay. Um, they can check the box and basically that's going to not withhold any um, payroll items that aren't mandatory. So basically just your taxes, okay? Um, they have the option to ignore a direct deposit. Maybe this is some sort of bonus payment. I know like COVID payments were popular um, and these, all, these need to pay, be paid by a physical check. Rather than going out and changing everybody's pay distribution, this is kind of like an override um, option. So you can check, they can check the box and it's gonna ignore how the employee is set up, uh, how their pay distribution is set up. And it's going to process everybody that's included in this payroll, a physical check, okay? And then is this a special pay or not? So this sort of you know, might go hand in hand with these other two options. Not all the time, but you know, maybe you're processing a special pay, you need this to be a physical check, and you also need to just withhold mandatory um, payroll items or deductions. So these you know, could all three be checked to do that. What, a, what um, checking a special pay box, what this does is it just initializes an empty set of payroll files. Then I would go to current, and I'm going to add in those employees that I um, want to pay in this special pay, okay? So for our example, we're gonna process you know, the entire payroll. So in this center um, bot column here, I need to tell the system what pay groups I want included in the, these first set of dates that I initial, want, that I'm going to initialize, excuse me, the payroll for. So again, to move um, all of these pay groups, instead of doing them one by one, I can select, click on the first row. I'm going to hold my shift key down and I'm going to click on the last row. That's going to highlight everything in between. And I can easily then just click the right arrow and that's going to move all of these pay groups to this set of dates that I originally entered um, on the left column. Now, some districts are then initializing, um, you know, other specific pay groups for specific dates. So let me, for this to show you, I'm gonna move a couple pay groups over. Um, say for whatever reason, 
um, you have a couple, you know, these pay group 25 and pay group uh, 10, they need to be um, initialized for a different set of um, dates. So I'm gonna click add date range selection. I would then enter my start and stop date. And then I would add those specific pay groups to those sets of dates. Okay. So I know it's a, a, an example of that. If districts, if you're not familiar with why, you know, somebody might even be using this. Um, some districts have their regular employees on a two week leg, and then they might have their substitutes on a three week leg. So they can get, that gives them a little more time to get all the paperwork um, funneled into the treasurer's office. Um, so it's not as, as such a, a short turnaround time. So they might be initializing, you know, a two week lag for all their regular pay groups and then a three week, a different, you know, a three week lag um, or a different set of dates for those substitute pay groups. Okay. I am going to include all of the pay groups in our sample um, payroll run. Um, there was a suggestion, I have a request for when pay groups are moved over, it doesn't keep them in the pay group order. Um, actually, Carol, I'm gonna make a note of that because we do have um, a feed, feedback issue, I think it is, already in place, but I'll increase the number of times requested. Um, I do understand exactly what you're saying um, in the fact that it doesn't keep them in order. Okay, thank you, because um, I had a district that just migrated to redesign recently, and um, they, they must have 30 or 40 pay groups. Sure. And it is so hard to move them over and then yes. to find the ones I want to move back because, you know, they pay the majority of them. Yes. But not all of them. And I have a hard time finding the ones I want to move back over. Absolutely. Yeah. I totally understand what you're saying. Okay. Thank you. Um, I will increase that um, request. And we've actually had a couple requests come in recently, um, you know, with every with the, the new wave starting. Um, there's been a couple other recent requests for this. So hopefully we can get that resolved sooner than later. Great question or great, um, great feedback. Okay, so now I'm going to click initialize payroll. And what it does is it starts, you know, initializing all those pay groups that we've included in our payroll. And in the perfect world, um, everything turns green, right? All of your pay groups initialize, everything's great. Um, and then the payroll as a whole also um, initializes successfully. So everything's green. If you would have a pay group that's red, then we're gonna look at the air report and really whether your payroll as a whole turns green or you do have um, some sort of air you always want to look at this air report, no matter what, okay? It can give you information that's going to be helpful um, maybe in the next payroll that you process or, um, you know, information that you might um, need to keep in mind when you're balancing or that sort of thing. So in this case, because everything did turn green, the all of our pay groups as um, well as the pay group, or I'm sorry, the payroll in, as a whole, we're opening the air report and you can see it's listing warnings. So because everything turned green, we just do have warnings. If there were any errors, those are listed first and they're listed in red. And it's those are issues that are gonna need to be corrected before we can continue on in our payroll process, okay? So in this case, it's telling us, hey, there was um, payroll item 550, um, there wasn't enough remaining gross for this employee to have that um, payroll item withheld. Um, so it's creating an error adjustment and it will automatically try to withhold that extra missed amount um, the next time the employee is paid. 
Okay. So as I scroll down, you can see that most of these I think are all payroll items. And then lastly, um, it gives you information uh, um, saying that the last, um, this was the last pay for in the contract for the, these employees. So maybe it's, you know, fiscal year end time and um, we need to, you know, think about adding the new contracts for all of these people before we process our next pay. So again, just because everything, you know, in the payroll process is, is good, we always wanna look at this air report, okay? If something is red, we definitely have to fix that before it's gonna let us go any further. So say we had something that, you know, was preventing a pay group um, from initializing correctly. Um, we go out and we fix that. Um, it's as easy as clicking the modify payroll option. We would select then that pay group or pay groups that didn't initialize correctly. And then we can click update payroll. And that's going to then recalculate everything, all the um, compensations that are being paid within that pay group. And then our hope is it turns green um, and our payroll as a whole turns green as well. Okay, now I do wanna caution um, because I've had this happen um, <laughs> to districts before. Say they process, they make all of their um, exceptions, they post those in current, okay? They, there's an error um, within that um, pay group. So they make that change, they go out and they modify the payroll, they update that pay group and they run their pay report and all of their exceptions within that pay group are gone. That's again, another downside of using strictly current, okay? Make sure that they have not made any changes like posted any exceptions in current um, when they modify the payroll and update that pay group or it's gonna override everything that they've just done and revert back to the original. Okay, so you do wanna caution, you know, oh, you can just go in and make those changes, modify the payroll, update that pay group, voila, everything's good. Um, and unfortunately, <laughs> I you know, know firsthand that, you know, districts have lost some work um, because um, they have, you know, made all of their exceptions in current um, and that kind of got overridden when they updated that pay group, okay? Now, keep in mind, really the only time you have to re, you know, if everything's green and you're just, you know, you run the pay report and you realize, oh, I forgot to set up a deduction for somebody, a payroll item, excuse me. So I go to that employee's dashboard, I add that payroll item. Um, when I regenerate the pay report, it's going to recalculate um, that employee's um, pay automatically. So it's not something that you, you know, have to modify the payroll for and update um, in order for those changes to, to be effect, um, to go in effect. The only time you should really have to do that is if you make changes to their compensation, okay? You will have to delete them out of the payroll, re-add them back into the payroll in order for those changes to, to um, come in effect or for you to see those. Okay, um, before we get into the reports that we see here, I want to point out um, something. So now we've initialized, if I go to payroll, payroll payments current, I'm gonna see then all of those, um, pay, the, all of those employees and those compensations that are included within this pay. Okay, so I can see on this grid um, everything that's included in the payroll. Maybe I want to look at a specific person or a couple people because I know I made changes to those, just those few. Rather than running the entire district's payroll, um, there's a super easy way to do that. Um, I don't know if in Classic, if you remember that pop-up pay report option that was um, 
you know, pretty slick, you can actually find that employee. So if you have, you know, a whole list and you're just wanting to um, look for a specific person um, rather than either sort the, you know, column by last name and then scroll down the list, I could type in that, that name. It's going to take me, you know, to that specific um, record. Or if there are a couple people that I want to look at, I'm just going to randomly pick these two people. You can see now that this payroll report option is available. Um, once I select one person, I can click this. I'm going to generate the report. And I can then see that this report gives me an easy way to look at just those select people. Instead of running the entire district pay report, I can then look at exactly who I made those changes to um, and make sure that before I go any farther that you know this looks correct. My change looks good. Okay. So an easy way to look at just select groups of people or, or um, one person. I'm going to go back to payroll then, payroll processing. Now you can see that there is a payroll. We've initialized the payroll, so it's going to show that it's in progress. So And it's bolded. So I'm going to go off to the right-hand side and click Detail. And these are the reports then the district will want to use for balancing purposes, OK? So the first one they probably want to look at is pay report. Um, they can sort this by several different ways. So again, if there are somebody in the district um, that just works with specific pay groups, they have the means to um, generate the report in that manner. OK? I'm going to generate the report. And this is sort of like I and I Cal and um, the Calc Pay report kind of combined. Um, when I open the pay report, obviously you see um, you know, everybody that's included in the payroll, their pay amounts, their payroll items, and then the pay accounts that are um, being charged. And then if I scroll all the way to the bottom, I'm gonna see some totals that you would normally see at the bottom of your um, uh, I and I Cal report and pay report. So we can see here um, your gross pay amounts. Um, you can see your total of your direct deposit. So this is what the district will use then to balance back to when they actually create their ACH submission file. And then another um, thing I like that this report offers is the total checks. So districts really know um, based on their pay report, do I have any physical check people or not? Um, sometimes, you know, they have, there's districts that don't require direct deposit or they have those few that were grandfathered in, you know, that they're, you know, um, not, comfortable with direct deposits. So the district allows that. So they're getting still getting physical checks. So this is a good way to, to, to know, hey, do I really need to pro, you know, process those payments, those check payments when I'm um, processing my payroll? Or is that a step I can skip um, this time because I don't have anything that needs to be um, printed? Um, your total employees, your total positions, Total females, certified um, employees, they need that for reports they do outside of the payroll process. And then it's gonna give you your um, totals by pay group, and then your pay type, and then your payroll item totals, okay? So again, districts, you know, they're taking, they probably have some means to um, know that this should be by gross amount for this payroll. <clears throat> and then they're taking anything that they've entered in future and they're going to add those two totals together. So my tape total or whatever kind of balancing tool I have to balance my exceptions matched my future summary report. And then now I know that 
I can take that total and look at the bottom of the um, pay report to see that this total future gross amount is correct as well. So my regular gross amount plus everything that came in from future should be my, should balance what I'm expecting my gross for this payroll to be. Okay. All right. So that's the pay report. Um, the, uh, we talked about the air report, the pay amount summary report. So districts like to use this because it's a quick, easy way um, to just look at pay amounts. So if we're not um, so much looking at uh, pay accounts at this time or deduction payroll items that were withheld, I'm sorry, I'm like having a hard time <laughs> today not using that word. Um, then they can just use the pay amount summary report. It's just a condensed um, pay report with just pay amounts um, listed on it. So it's gonna give you then um, by uh, position, the amount that this employee is being paid, okay? So I know districts also like to use this for balancing as well. Just a quick like tip, and I'm sure you guys all know this, but um, if you use control F at any, anywhere in the application that brings up that pop-up box in the upper right hand corner. So if I'm looking for somebody specific, you know, there's no need for me to scroll all the way through the report. I can actually just type that. It's gonna find every occurrence of what I, you know, typed. And then I can use the up and down arrows um, to move throughout the report if there are multiple, um, you know, occurrences of what I just typed, okay? So I'm sure you guys all know that, but um, you know I use that all the time to to move through um, various points of re in re in reports. Next, then um, the next two are your um, payroll item reports. So one is the detail, and one is the summary. So these are just what's being withheld in the payroll that we're processing, not not what's going to be paid. At, you know when it comes to the payables because you could have like your insurances, um, annuities, those sorts of things um, split between the first and second pay. So again, this is just what's being withheld during this payroll, okay? So what's nice about these this report, maybe I changed all of my health insurance. I just wanna specifically look at my insurances um, and make sure that everything looks good. I can run this then for specific payroll item or items. So if I just want to look at my insurances, I would select those, um, you know, payroll items, and then know, you know, run the report, and I can have an easy way to just look through those um, without looking at the entire report. Okay, I can also generate this in Excel. Um, and you know maybe total it so I know what my insurances should be. I um, can have that totaled in Excel um, and look at it that way. Okay. By selecting nothing, then that will generate the reports for everything. Okay. So again, the districts, you know, they're going to want these. These reports are there for you know, a, a purpose. So they are going to want to run, you know, all of these reports and make sure that everything um, looks as, as they, you know, hoped it would. The summary report is just by payroll item. So it's gonna give me a total by payroll item, um, you know, for all, again, all of the payroll items that are being withheld during this payroll. Okay, then last are the budget reports. So um, this is gonna give you um, the summary and the detail of all of those pay accounts then, excuse me, that are being charged um, during this payroll. So again, the budget distribution report is a summary by account. And then we have the pay account distribution report 
and this is going to give you the detail. So maybe there's been new grant accounts set up um, and we want to you know, pay particular attention to those, or maybe when we need, we're getting towards the end of the fiscal year and we need to see how much is going to be charged to those grant accounts so we don't you know, over ex expend to those accounts. Um, we can run this report then and see um, how much um, per employee um, and then a total by account are being charged. Okay. A couple of the things um, I wanted to point out <clears throat> that are super helpful with the, in the redesign are the fact that I realized that I initialized my um, payroll for incorrect dates. I realized that it's the wrong pay date. I realized it's the wrong pay cycle, pay of the month. Um, there is the option to delete the payroll and start over. So again, another benefit of using future. If I've used future for all of my exceptions, if I click, excuse me, click delete payroll, it's going to place all of those exceptions back into future and allow me to reinitialize the payroll and start over and I've lost nothing, okay? There is the option to delete payroll and exceptions. Use this with caution because it is truly doing what it says and it's going to delete your payroll and any of those exceptions that you've entered in future and totally wipe out you know, basically everything that you've done, including those future exceptions, okay? So I'm not sure how often this option, you know, is used. Obviously there's a need for it or it wouldn't be there, um, but if a district, you know, mistakenly enters something incorrectly over here, um, they can actually delete the payroll and start over. So you're gonna delete it, and then that will put everything back into future and they can reinitialize and start from the beginning. Okay. All right. Um, another thing that I just wanna point out because we have had some questions about this recently too. Um, when districts are running their SERS per pay report, and it's not giving them the information that they've ex they, they're expecting. And they're like, you know, they've entered the dates correctly. You know, what could be causing the problem? I like to go to the details of the payroll and look at the dates that all of the um, pay groups were initialized for. Um, chances are they did use the additions option and some pay groups were added with different a different date range. You know, again, not uncommon. And then they just forget in SERS um, per pay to add that additional um, set of dates so that it will include those pay groups of people, you know, as well. So this is a real easy place to go look and say, you know, did they initialize their payroll for, you know, all their pay groups with the same dates or not? Um, so I just wanted to point that out as well. Okay. So the district has balanced everything. Um, you know, they've looked over their reports. Um, everything looks great. They're ready to move on. The next step then is to actually post the payroll. So I'm going to click post payroll. And you'll get a pop-up box and says, are you sure you wanna do this? We're gonna say yes. This is very, very similar to check update. It's not the exact same as check update. Um, redesign is again, more flexible um, in the fact that even if I've posted my payroll, if I have not done one of two things, either A, created my ACH, I'm sorry, my HSA file, or B, posted my outstanding payables, 
then I do have the ability to unpost the payroll. Okay, so this option allows me to basically um, start back at the point of just the payroll being initialized. So if a district forgot to add, you know, again, maybe they were supposed to add the supplemental payments to this payroll and they forgot. Well, as long as they haven't A, created their HSA file or B, um, process their outstanding payables, they will be able to unpost their payroll. And again, that puts them back to the point of basically just initializing the payroll. Um, they can go back and add into the payroll any of those compensations that need paid, rerun all of their reports, and then they can post their payroll and continue on. Okay? So, once they've posted their payroll, um, the next step then is to process their payments. So again, based, because um, we looked at our pay report and we saw no um, checks, physical checks that were to be printed in this um, payroll, this is a step that we could skip, okay? Um, but if you have a, a district that needs their, you know, they have some physical check people and those need to be printed, they would select the checks option. They're gonna select XML. Um, their bank account should um, default for them. So they just wanna make sure that's correct. And if there's a better way that they would like their checks sorted, maybe they physically take them, you know, to distribute um, at the building, various buildings, um, they can sort them in the, the way that makes most sense to them. And then the starting check number should default. So that's not something that they should have to enter. And then the output file name is gonna be checks.xml. So once they click process payments, then it creates that checks.xml file. They would simply upload that to their printing software, you know, whether it be Edge or um, SC View, um, whatever they're using for their printing. And then that will allow them to then print those um, physical checks. So again, if they're not a district that's, you know, um, th that they require direct deposits, um, and furthermore, they require email direct deposits, then there's going to be nothing to, for them to process when it comes to process payments. Um, maybe they have some um, paper direct deposit employees, not all of their employees get their, their direct deposit emailed. They would then select direct deposits, PDF. Again, the bank account in this case is really kind of irrelevant. Um, they wanna make sure that that defaults to the correct choice. They can also sort these um, in the manner that would make most sense to them. Um, you have um, the output file name is gonna be by default called directdeposits.pdf. It asks you what form you want to use um, to print your direct deposits. So I know, I know a lot of you might be um, customizing those direct deposits for your districts. Maybe you're taking the default direct deposit and incorporating like a district logo at the top. Um, and then you're importing that um, into the report manager um, for them to use, um, you know, for this purpose. So if that's the case, they're going to want to change then that direct deposit form to be the custom, you know, whatever you've called their custom direct deposit form. And then that way it'll print on that pretty, you know, district specific um, form. You're going to click process payments. That's going to give you then that direct deposits.pdf file for you to print. Um, and, you know, it will be the pretty version of that district's paper direct deposits. There is a print all direct deposits um, option. I'm not sure, um, you know, obviously some, someone throughout the state needed this, but um, what this does is it does give you the ability to print 
copies of all of the direct deposits, no matter if they're set up to be um, emailed or not. So if the district would have a need for that, um, for whatever reason, um, they can, you know, obviously check this box and that's gonna create the file, the PDF file with everybody that gets a direct deposit. Okay, so that is processing payments. Um, again, this might be a step that the district could skip um, if they don't have physical checks that they're printing um, and or paper direct deposits um, that they need printed. So, um, you know, kind of district specific. This would be similar to check print um, in Classic, um, if you're familiar with that. Okay. All right. I think we'll go over one next step and then we're gonna take a little break, give you guys some time to stretch, get some coffee, um, whatever you need to do for a, about five minutes. Um, the next thing though I wanna talk about is processing your ACH um, uh, payment or file, I'm sorry. So under reports, not processing, there's an option that's called ACH submission. So we're gonna use the ACH submission tab. The system will automatically default the pay date to be um, the date the payroll, the pay date the payroll was initialized for. So keep this in mind, you might have districts that their pay date is Friday, um, but they allow the, their employees to be, have their direct deposit a day early. So this date you know, can be changed if that needs to happen, um, but it will automatically default to the pay date um, when the payroll was initialized. The next um, field is the ACH source. So this is set up um, under core um, ACH source. So this is like their dirt depth information, um, how you know, the file is gonna get created and then um, uh, the, the format of the file um, that gets uploaded to the bank. So this should default for them. I, you, know, you know, there might be some districts throughout the state, larger districts that have multiple ACH sources for payroll. Um, if that's the case, that they're going to want to make sure that they, you know, create, choose the right ACH source for their ACH file. Whether you include the employee SSN or not, I feel like most banks are not requiring that um, any longer. However, um, you know, if there is a bank that still does require that, you have the ability to change that so that the social security number will be included. Um, or you can even replace it with um, an employee ID. By default, they are not included, okay? So if, if there is a bank that still is needing that, um, then the district will wanna change that so the SSNs are included on the report or the um, ACH file. For um, the sort by option, this is basically you know, a means for you to look at the report, verify everything's correct, so you can sort this by name or number. Probably name makes most sense if you're wanting to check something specific. We're ha we have to go down to the bottom and then um, check the payroll for the pay that we want to generate the report and eventually the submission file for. So we're gonna go down and we're gonna check the 325 payroll. And then I'm gonna click generate report. So this report, you know, they're going to want to generate the report first and make sure that A, you know, if there are any changes to their direct deposits, that they, um, you know, that looks correct on the report before they create the submission file, as well as the total. Okay, so I'm going to let's see if I can find my pay report here. Um, yeah, it should be this one. I'm going to bring back up my pay report. And I can see here, sorry, if I scroll all the way down to the bottom, 
my pay report total, I probably can't see this very well, should be 26,127.87. Okay, so that's what we're expecting um, our direct deposit, our ECH report um, total to be as well. So the district will want to go back to that. pay report and scroll all the way down and you can see that my ACH report also totals 26,127.87. So I know that the file that's going to the bank is going to be for the correct amount. And then likewise, you know, if you have changed somebody's account number, routing number, both, um, you would want to Probably, you know, use control F again, find that employee um, that you made the change to, and then just verify, you know, that their routing number and or account number, whatever you changed, appears to be correct. Okay. Once we've verified the report and we know that that amount is accurate, um, whoops, I'm gonna leave that checked. The only thing that we should need to change then is to generate the submission file. So if I click that, that's creating then my ACH file that will then be uploaded to um, the district's bank. You know, they have a website they're probably going to to upload that file and um, a process that's specific to that bank to get that file um, to them. Okay. And then lastly, um, while we're here, is if the district you um, has an HSA in place. So if they have um, HSAs that you know the employee is contributing to, and or the board is um, contributing to, they're going to want to create just like an ACH report and submission they will create an HSA report and submission. If the district is um, wanting to upload that HSA file to the bank. I know some districts are still taking a physical check um, to the bank and then that gets you know, deposited into the employee's accounts that way. Um, so if that's the case, then obviously they wouldn't be using the HSA submission to generate a file that's going to be electronically uploaded to the bank. Um, they would be just creating um, a payables check during the outstanding processing or outstanding payables process. And then that would get taken you know, to the bank or sent to the bank. However, they're getting it to them. Um, but this step would be ignored then. But if they are a district that's you know, wanting to submit their HSA electronically, they would create, and I can see that this that doesn't have an HSA ACH source. And again, that's coming from core ACH source. They would have to create one then for their HSA, okay? And the type then on that ACH source would be the health savings account. Okay, so that's where that is um, coming from. And they would have that in place, obviously, before they create their HSA file. So that would populate here. Um, again, depending on the bank, do they want to include the employee social security number or not? Is that required? By default, it's not. And then basically for the report again, how they want to look at that report, do they want it sorted by name or number? And then you can um, generate this in um, a different format if you'd like. So maybe you wanna you know, generate it in Excel so you can do some kind of totaling, subtotaling, that sort of thing. But we'll go down to the bottom here and check the box on the 325 payroll. And then we're gonna click generate HSA report. We always wanna generate the report first. 
yeah, I don't think we have this set up, so I apologize. It's very similar to the HS, I'm sorry, the ACH submission report. So you're, it's going to give you a total. Um, the totals are obviously what you want to check. Um, again, that's going to be the total based on the employee and the employer share. So if that applies, that, that report gives you um, a total for both. Okay. And then when you're, um, when you, after you've verified the report, everything looks good, you're going to generate the HSA submission file. And then again, that's what, if you're submitting this electronically, that's what gets uploaded to the bank. The district follows the, you know, bank directions to get that um, file um, uploaded to the, their website. Okay. Now, I, I did want to point out when we're talking about HSAs, we did have um, a couple questions. It was more than one district has, or more than one ITC has asked, as districts are migrating, um, they actually have an HSA um, at, at districts where part of their employees are getting a physical check taken to the bank, and then part of their employees are getting their funds via um, an ACH HSA submission file. So in classic, it worked a little differently um, than what it does in redesign. What you will have to do if you have that situation at a district that you're working with, they actually are gonna have to set up a new payee. So right now, you know, everything that's um, associated with that HSA that payee is set to be electronic. So that box would be checked. It would you know, have the bank information um, as the payee. And then that payroll item configuration screen is pointing to that electronic payee. So I'm not, I'm not using a very good example here, so I apologize, but hopefully you're getting my gist that payee would be assigned to that payroll item configuration, which is electronic. Well, not all of the employees are receiving their HSA electronically. For those that are set up to be, you know, the physical check created for that group of people and taken to the bank, what will have to happen is a new payee is going to need to be created and that payee will not be electronic. So this electronic payment, I just randomly picked two of the exact opposite. So this would not be checked. And then you can fill out you know, the, the information here. Another thing that um, while, we're, while I'm thinking about it, that was helpful is this number here. This can be whatever you want in classic, you know, they were either like the vendor number that came over from the USAS side or um, like 700, um, 701, you know, that sort of thing. This can be whatever makes most sense to the district. So I know in some cases we've said use the number of like HSA dash um, check. And then on the other payee, for those that are getting um, included in the electronic submission file, that number could be HSA dash, um, you know, electronic or something like that. When you go then to add that payroll item to that employee, I'm sorry, when you go to add the payee to the payroll item configuration, you can easily identify then that payee by in this number field down here, it would have HSA dash electronic, HSA dash check. So you know then that you're picking the right payee that's going to apply to that payroll item configuration. Okay. And then obviously those that are getting a physical check, we would have to 
um, add that payroll item configuration to that employee so that you know group of employees that are getting their HSA submitted via paper check, that payroll item would point to that payroll item configuration, which is assigned to that physical check payee. Have I totally lost everybody? <laughs> and maybe you won't ever encounter that at your, um, with any of your districts. We've just had, we have had a couple um, here recently um, with the new wave of districts. So I thought I would mention that when we're talking about HSAs. Okay. All right. Let's take about, you know, a five minute break, um, get up, stretch, um, and we will come back. Let's, let's come back at like 1045, make it easy. Okay. All right. We'll see you in just about five minutes.
Okay. <clears throat> we will continue on with our payroll process. Um, we left off with creating our um, ACH file and the HSA file. Um, so now um, districts are going to want to submit their um, email notices. So I'm going to go back to payroll, payroll processing. And you can see now because we've posted the payroll um, that it's you know no longer in progress. So we're going to go to the details. Um, one thing I did <clears throat> want to point out, and I, I sort of forgot to come back to this, um, but the budget reports that are produced after the payroll is posted um, these are sort of like the official reports. So um, if districts are looking for <clears throat> the budget distribution report like they had in Classic that has the, the place for the treasurer's signature um, at the bottom, and a lot of times they'll keep these, you know, in a binder somewhere because the auditors will ask for them um, or somewhere with their, you know, each payroll. Um, this is the, the report then once the payroll's posted, um, this is the budget report then that has that um, information, you know, for the treasurer's signature and the gross amount of the um, payroll and so forth. Okay, I forgot to point that out before. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, once then the district is ready to submit their email notices, they're going to click this option here. We aren't set up. Um, for this to be enabled because we don't want to mistakenly send out notices um, um, in this test account. But what will happen is your, the district would click this um, option here. And let me just, this may be helpful if I go to the documentation and I can show you what the screen looks like at least. I'm going to go to email notices. Okay, so once we click on the email notice option, there's going to be a pop up screen that appears. And this um, allows the district to change the date and the time. So you know that magic 2am that districts, you know, receive their, um, their email notices went out, that can now um, be district specific. So if they want them sent out at 5am, um, they can do so. So they can click the calendar to change the date or they can physically, um, you know, put in the day <clears throat> that they like the notices delivered and as well as the time. And then by default, everybody um, in the payroll, that particular payroll that's receiving, um, that's set up to be, um, have their direct deposit emailed, will be moved to the selected side. So they shouldn't have to, you know, touch those unless for some obscure reason, you know, they're, they're not wanting um, certain certain employees to receive their notice. Again, um, they're going to go down to this direct deposit form. And if they have a custom direct deposit form in place, like we talked about before, um, whoops, they can click on that option to select the, the custom form, whatever the name of that might be. And then they're gonna click schedule sending of selected email notices. So again, um, you know, depending on the date they um, enter here, if they don't change it, it sends them you know, immediately. If they're wanting to, you know, it's Tuesday and they're working on payroll, um, they don't want them um, to be delivered to their employees until Friday morning, then that's the date and the time they're gonna um, enter here. Now what happens is that gets um, that job then if it if if they're sent to be scheduled later, that's going to be able to be seen under the job scheduler. Okay, so if you go to utilities job scheduler, then it's going to list here that direct deposit um, job. It tells how many notices are going to be sent. And then over on the right hand side, it will give you a status and then the date that it will be holding um, 
you know, in, in the, it says pending under the status. So <clears throat> districts have the ability now, say that they need to check the date that they um, submitted those notices. Maybe they're not 100% confident that they scheduled them for the right date or time, um, or they didn't. Um, they have the ability now to go under the job scheduler. And if they submitted those email notices for an incorrect time or date, they can actually delete that job themselves. So they're gonna click the X and then they would go back to the payroll, payroll processing details, and they're going to regenerate those email notices. Okay, so they no longer have to, um, you know, reach out to you at the ITC and have you delete that batch job, they can actually delete that scheduled job themselves. Okay, say an employee um, comes into uh, tre the treasurer's office and they say, I didn't receive my um, notice. Um, can, I, can I get another copy of it? Okay. The districts also have a way to regenerate that email notice. So I'm gonna just pick on an employee. I'm gonna go to um, Anna Buck's dashboard. I'm gonna click on payments. And I'm gonna find then, you know, maybe they need the last five because they're going to the bank for some kind of loan or proof of, um, you know, employment for some reason. Maybe they only need one, um, but you can you can select as many direct deposit notices um, as the employee is needing. So I'm going to check those all that apply. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to click print payment checks and direct deposit. It brings up a pop up window. I'm going to click direct deposits. PDF. That's gonna be my file name, directdeposits.pdf. I can then choose that pretty custom form that we've you know, created just that's district specific. And then I'm gonna click process payments. All this is doing is regenerating those email notices in PDF format. It's not reissuing a check. It's not, it's not doing anything else other than creating a PDF file for the district to give to that employee, whether it be attach it to an email and get it to them that way, or if they're standing in their office and you know they want to print this out and hand it to them. But this is an easy way for um, districts to regenerate them, regenerate email notices themselves. Okay, I don't know about you guys, but lots of times you'd get calls. You know, can we have you know so and so's email? notice for the last, you know, five pays regenerated. And there really wasn't an easy way to do that in classic, right? Well, in redesign, super easy. Okay. You could even resend the notice to them. Um, if you went back to payroll, payroll processing, and you go to the details of that notice, under email notices, you know, instead of um, having all everybody on the right hand side, you know, as under the selected option, you would just move everybody to the left side to unselect them and move to just to the, you know, the right side, the selected section, that one or few employees that you need to resend the notice to. So you could go about it that way as well. Okay. All right, moving right along. The next um, item then that the employee would want <clears throat> um, to do is, I wanna make sure I'm following somewhat our agenda, which I, I feel like I've been all over the place. Um, Let's talk about then the um, 
submission files. Okay, so um, when we posted the payroll, that then creates, um, like if you're used to classic, that created like a batch file, that then you'd go into auto post and you'd post using the payroll option. In the, the redesign, it when you click post payroll, that also creates a, a file um, and it's a submission file. So all of those submission files or anything to do with submission files is gonna be under USAS integration. So I'm gonna go USAS integration and I'm gonna click on payroll submission. So you can see here that that payroll file that when we posted the payroll, it created this um, submission file dated 325. And we, if we go off to the far right, you, we can see that it is not posted to USAS yet. So by clicking this post to USAS option, it brings up all the information in that submission file. We have not sent it yet. It gives me my totals. It gives me all the accounts and the amounts that are gonna be charged. <clears throat> and I'm gonna click submit to USAS. Now, just like classic, you know, the district wants to be careful with um, what they do from here forward with the file. Remember, USAS and payroll have two different posting periods, okay? Payroll can submit the file to USAS, but if USAS is not in their current processing month isn't March on that side, they're gonna to want to stop and not do anything further with that payroll submission file, okay? Um, they wanna make sure that the, the when they're posting those pending transactions on the USAS side, you know, USAS is also in the correct, the current processing month that, you know, that payroll is. Again, they can send them, submit them to USAS, but if USAS is still in March, then they're not gonna want to continue the process on the USAS side to post that pending transaction until USAS is in March, okay? So now if I return to this um, payroll listing, you can see that the status changed and it's now says, pending okay and then it's going to change again once they actually post the pending transaction on the USAS side okay so you can kind of see the flow of you know if it's waiting to be sent to USAS or submitted to USAS when it's sent to USAS and I apologize we don't have one that shows what have what the status after it's actually posted all right. Okay, so that completes like the payroll submission file. Um, there are also a couple optional um, tools um, that that districts can use um, during the payroll process as well. One is for their um, employer retirement. Um, share and the other is their employer distribution um, amounts. So employer distribution equals board dis. So during the payroll process, these were the accounts and these were the amounts that were withheld for board paid benefits like um, retirement, Medicare, um, insurances, those sorts of things. So now what the system, what we can do is we can run the employer distribution report and it's going to look at the original salary account that the um, employee was paid from. It's going to then look at what object codes are defined on that payroll item configuration, certified, classified, other. 
It's also going to look at mapping. So if I go to utilities, mapping, what's the, what was the original salary account that was charged with the substituted benefit object code based on the screen we just looked at? And then are there any of those accounts that are mapped to something else? If so, this is the final account then that employer distribution is going to use. Okay. This can be a beast in itself. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because um, we only have an hour left um, this morning. However, we are having a training session just on employer distribution, empl employer retirement share. I think it's in the at the end of November, if I'm not mistaken. Let me look it up quick. So that might be, um, you know, if you're looking for more specific um, training just on those two topics, because like I said, they can be um, complex to understand. Um, we are having that session and it is, it's November 18th. So go out to our training registration page and you know if that's something that you're interested in learning more about, um, please sign up for that and it'll be a session just um, on that. And we're gonna cover it from beginning um, all the way through the end um, of the process on the USAS side. So that might be um, helpful as well. Okay. So, you know, again, if a district is just migrating, um, getting back to account mapping, all of their mapping should, you know, have migrated over. So there shouldn't be anything new needed unless they're changing the way, you know, they want something charged. Okay. So the very first thing they want to do to um, eventually arrive at getting those submission files that we were talking about is they want to run, run the report option first. So under reports, there's an employer distribution report. This is what they're always gonna to wanna to run to start. It's kind of like the validation versus you know, actual option. So they can generate this in multiple formats. Um, they'll enter the start date and the end date. This is all pay date driven. So um, if this is like Medicare, for instance, where they're paying this their board share of Medicare every pay, then they would be entering one pay date as the start date and end date. If this is maybe their insurances where they withhold you know, half one pay, the first pay of the month, half the second pay of the month, they would then be entering the start date as their first pay of the month, the end date as the last pay of their month. They can choose to generate the report by pay cycle. Probably not very common. They're probably actually picking the code that they want this um, report to be generated for. So I'm actually gonna go down and pick Medicare, okay? How do I want the um, report sorted? By payroll item code. They can change that if they'd like. And then also, if you're running this for multiple um, payroll items, you can have it subtotaled by payroll items. So that'll be make the report easy to read. Now, here's something to keep in mind when we talked about, you know, a little bit about the charging process. Um, this is this flag here, use only employer distribution accounts, is basically an override field. So if I have my payroll report pulled up, still I do not. Let me see if I can find it quick. The pay report is, um, an easy way to see how the pay accounts were set up during the payroll process. So here I can see that under this BD field or column, this pay account was set to no for employer distribution. 
this one here was set to a Y. Yes, use this account um, in the employer distribution charging. Okay. Medicare probably districts want every account charged to its the Medicare account, right? Um, there might be times with grants that perhaps, you know, they don't, they want Medicare charged, but they don't want other benefits like insurances, um, retirement, those sorts of things charged. So in conjunction with mapping and the way the pay account the employer distribution flag is checked or not checked on the pay account. At the time the payroll was run, you can use this checkbox here to kind of override and use any account that was charged during the payroll process, whether it was flagged for employer distribution or not. So they might have, you know, depending on how they're wanting things charged, they might not have their grant accounts checked for employer distribution. And then when they run their Medicare through employer distributions, they can check the box, I'm sorry, uncheck the box that says use only employer distribution accounts. That will then look and go out and find any account that was charged during the payroll process and go through its whole, you know, order of events to finally arrive at the account that it's going to be that's going to be charged but it will use at all accounts so for instance for medicare i'm going to leave this unchecked actually i'm going to show you two ways i'm going to check the box now do i have a report let me see here. I'm going to pull back up the um, pay report. And down here, my 692, my Medicare, my total should be for the board $519.99. Okay. I'm going to run my employer distribution report saying use only. Whoops, I'm on the wrong, I'm so sorry. I'm like, wait, those totals look way off. I run my employer distribution report and I only get a total of 481.17. There's a difference there. My total, what we just saw, you know, should be higher. So that tells me that there were some pay accounts that were not flagged for employer distribution. And that's true because we just looked at, at one example, right? So now let's rerun employer distribution. We're going to uncheck the box saying, use every account that was charged during the payroll process to get my total. And you know, it goes through the whole process of distributing, you know, arriving at the, um, benefit account. If I go down to the bottom, my total matches now what I'm expecting it to be. Okay. So it's sort of district specific in how they have their account charging set up, how they want things charged. But just keep in mind that this can be used as an override. So depending on how they have things up, set up no matter how they have things set up if you uncheck this box it's going to charge everything that was every account that was charged during the payroll process now once you have looked at the report and that looks good then we're going to go to ucs integration and we're going to go to employer distribution submission and we're going to do the same thing here we're going to enter our pay dates. So in this case, it's the same date. And I'm going to come down and I'm gonna select just my Medicare um, payroll item. And again, we have the same ability 
when we create the submission. So we also wanna make sure that this box is unchecked if we unchecked it and our totals were right during the report part of things. We're gonna click show submission preview. And wow, we gotta have a lot, a lot of warnings, okay? So there's some accounts that aren't set up correctly. Is our total correct? Yes. Okay, so when you get those kind of errors that show up here, um, you know, obviously the district is going to want to look through these accounts. I can see right here, you know, our object code wasn't defined correctly on the payroll item configuration side of things. But we would need to fix, we would want to fix those if, um, you know, the account obviously isn't on the USAS side. So what account does the district want charged? And that's where I was talking earlier. I really find the expenditure account um, option under USAS integration to be super helpful because I can put in part of my salary account um, to find maybe the benefit um, object, you know, benefit account that I, that the district truly does have set up and wants charged. So maybe that means that they need to map, you know, use account mapping and map it from the account the system is trying to charge to the account they truly want charged. Um, you know, that sort of thing. Okay, so I'm going to go back then to, oops, employer distribution. I've entered all my information. I've verified, I've, you know, my accounts look good. My amount looks good. Once um, the file is ready to be created, then we're going to click this submit to USAS option. Again, it will show up in the grid here with um, the date, the description, the total, um, and then that is going to be sent over to the USAS side and it will be in the pending transactions and the district then can complete the process on the USAS side. And again, when we um, talk about the, this program um, in November, we're gonna go through that process from beginning to end. We just don't quite have time to do all that today. Okay, so that's board dis or employer distribution as it's now called in, in redesign. The other option then is the board RET or board retirement share. So at the end of the month, if the employer, or I'm sorry, if the district is using, um, if they're a foundation district and they were used to using board RET, keep in mind board RET was on the USAS side in Classic. It's now moved to the payroll side. So the charging is a bit different. Um, it uses, it does not use the month to date expenditures from the USAS side. It's using the payroll information at the time the payroll was processed to get its totals. Okay, so it is different. So first we would want to go to reports, employer retirement share. Looks a little similar to um, employer distribution. You would use um, the, your date range. Probably, you know, you're paying your foundation payment at the end of the month. So it's gonna encompass, you know, more than one pay. So you would put in your first pay of the month as the beginning date, the last pay of the month as the end date, and then you would enter the amount then, um, your foundation payment, um, your STRS and SERS, you know, whatever amounts you've, they, the district has received from those two retirement systems to be paid. You would generate the report. And then once the report is generated and it looks good, then we're gonna do the same thing as we did for the employer um, distribution. We're gonna to go to USAS integration and we're gonna select the employer retirement share submission option. And basically we're entering the same information as we did in the report. Your dates, then the amount you want to distribute for SERS and STRS you would click the show submission preview option as we did before. That's gonna give you amounts and accounts 
And then once you're satisfied, um, you would go down to the submit employer share of retirement to USAS. That then sends that file over to USAS and it will be listed under, their, under the pending transactions. You're gonna see it then in this grid here. Um, you know, any submission files that they begin to create in the redesign are gonna be listed in this grid here so they can reference back to them. Okay. All right. Let's move right along. Oh, one thing I wanna point out, cause it gets forgotten is, you know how we talked about um, in, on the employer distribution, there being this checkbox, it can be used as an override kind of um, feature. There's a similar option on the employer distribution side of things. And that's under system configuration in its employer retirement share configuration. So if I open this, there's a similar feature um, when it comes to employer retirement share as employer distribution. Um, it's just at the configuration level. So you know this box is gonna control whether or not all accounts are being charged or only those that are set for employer distribution. So if a district is looking at a way to override, you know, how the payroll side of things were processed um, when it comes to employer retirement share, they have the ability to, um, you know, kind of override those pay account fields as well. Okay. All right. Let's see. Let's talk about um, processing your outstanding payables. So the district, um, once they post their payroll, then their, any amounts that were withheld during the payroll process, those get moved to um, outstanding, the outstanding payables option, which is under processing. So I'm gonna go to processing, process outstanding payables, you can see here then, as districts are posting payrolls, these amounts then are going to be placed in this area and continue to accumulate as payrolls are processed until these um, payments are posted, okay? There's several grids um, in the payables area, and this kind of gives you a different way to look at the information. So the first tab, payables by payee, this gives you um, a way to see who the check is gonna be made payable to, the amount of the employee and the employer, um, the number of employees, and then whether or not this is a, an electronic payment or not. So there is a nice feature here on the grid that allows you, you know, to sort those or filter your grid by um, an electronic payment or not. So if you a district has the, you know, the need to, to look at those payments um, in that manner, they can. Okay, if it's blank, then that's giving you um, all of your um, payments electronic or not electronic. So this, you know, tells us this first tab. Um, if I post this payment. Uh, this payable, Alamo signs, a check will be cut for $73.27. And I know it's going to be a physical check because the electronic payment um, option is set to false. Okay, if I go to the next tab, this gives me the ability to then look at it by code. So a lot of, you know, a lot of classic users know that the 001 record is federal, 002 state, you know, your 500s are your annuities, your 600s are your regular um, 800s, OSDIs, and so forth. So if they have the need to, to look at something, you know, broken out by code, they have the ability to do that. 
Now, the difference between these two, we you could have your federal and maybe your Medicare both assigned to the same payee, meaning those payments are getting combined and sent to the same place. So this gives you the ability to see, oh, my total for federal is this amount. My total for Medicare is this amount. If I go back to the first tab, that's the, this screen is gonna combine those two payments, if this was the case, and it would list who you know the payment is being made payable to, and then the total of those two combined payroll items. Okay. The third tab then gives you even more detail, and it's broken out by payroll item and employee. So if I need to know how much you know is being withheld for. Um, Gloria Pitts for federal, um, you know, maybe um, I, I withheld something from this employee and I really shouldn't have. And I want to correct the check before it gets, or the payment before it gets made. Um, I would want to then maybe look at payables by payroll item type and then find that employee to locate that amount, you know this insurance, okay? So it's all how you, you wanna look at the grid or you know how you need to look at the grid. And then the last is even more detail. This payables adjustment um, tab allows you to do just what I was talking about. Say I withheld insurance from somebody and now I'm looking at the bill. Oh shoot, I shouldn't have withheld that. I wanna make the check correct before I send it to the insurance company. So I can click on the payables adjustment tab. I can click create, and I am going to post an adjustment to Gloria Pitts for, we'll just, and again, <clears throat> how much do I need, you know, how much did she have withheld that I don't want to send um, to the um, deduction company? I'm going to, I should have looked at the amount. I'm going to make it a negative 50. And I can even use a description then to say like, you know, withheld in March. It's spell correctly in error. Once I save that, then if I would go back to Gloria Pitts and that 003 record, obviously she didn't have as she had less than um, fifty dollars um, withheld originally. So that you know fifty dollars was credited back to her um, amount to make it a negative, you know, $11.44. So that would then short the amount of my payment to this insurance company, you know, by basically the $50. I'm using a really bad example, I apologize. So that's a way that the districts can short the payment that's getting sent to the, the um, deduction company prior to you know um, it, it being paid or, or sent. So the payables adjustments is what they can use for that. Now, this is not refunding it back to the employee. So if it was withheld in air, this is just correcting the payment side of things, okay? They would want, excuse me, to post an air adjustment on that employee's payroll item to give that back to them. Okay, so it's not touching that side of things. Then the other thing they need to keep in mind is because they're posting an error adjustment to give it back to the employee, that will automatically post a negative in the outstanding payables and try to short the check again. So there is there are cases where they might have to post another payables adjustment for a positive amount 
so it does not get shorted um, you know, a second time. So it would be very similar to in Classic, you just going in and removing the amount from the accumulator, okay? Same concept. Instead of removing an accumulator, we're gonna post a payables adjustment. Okay, so if I go back, I removed that adjustment. I didn't post the payment yet. So you can see here that, um, you know, it went back to the $38.56. Okay, the very first thing then the districts are gonna wanna do is to um, create their payables reports. So once they are, um, you know, go to, outstanding payables, we're gonna click payables reports. The first thing I would suggest doing is checking this box that says page break on payroll item code. If a district is sending something, um, you know, some sort of report with their checks, then this is gonna give them a good clean like break, um, you know, for the, the payroll item once the payroll item changes, that, that report's gonna start on a new page all by itself. So they'll have a, you know, an easy way to separate that report to send whatever part they might need to um, along with the payment. And then probably most generally, districts are choosing to pay their, their payables by cycle, meaning on the payroll item configuration. So if I go to core payroll item configuration, Just got to pick on one here. How often is this deduction to be paid, this payroll item to be paid? So there's a payment cycle field. Is this something that they're paying every pay? Medicare, you know, federal, um, you know, those sorts of things. Or is it paid on a monthly basis? We're withholding it multiple pays, but we're only paying it at the end of the month. Maybe there are some cities that are still paid quarterly, um, annually. You can even set up a user defined fields, but the, the user has to know what you know, each of those def these defined fields mean. So is it you know, one meaning you know, after the first pay of the month, two meaning after the second pay, even if there's a third pay of the month, those sorts of things, okay? So that's what, when you go to the, go back to outstanding payables, when you go to process your payables by payment cycle, that's what it's looking at. So I'm gonna click every pay. Um, if they're a district that does not use the payment cycle option on the payroll item configuration, you can actually select by code. So maybe they're a district that prefers to choose them themselves. So they're going through each pay and they're moving over all of those codes that apply to the pay of the month that they're um, paying their payables. Okay, a little more time consuming. Then there's two reports. There's the full report and there's the summary report. And I would recommend that they run both of these. So I'm gonna click every pay and I'm gonna click full report and summary report. So the full report gives me by code uh, all the amounts that are, that are being included for that employee for that specific payroll item. And again, because we chose the option to break page break, when the code changes, we have a nice pretty report that if I need to send, you know, the O. Oh, Three, there's no 03, like city um, information with that payment, um, I can pull that, you know, those pages out of the report and easily do that. The summary report is just going to give me a total by code. So federal, this is the amount of the payment, the employee and the employer amounts. Okay. Once I've run my reports, I have copies of those, uh, you know, everything looks good. Then I'm basically gonna do the same thing um, by selecting the pay cycle that I want to actually cut the checks for. So in the upper left-hand corner, there's a select payroll cycles. I'm gonna then move 
my pay cycle that I want to process because it's the you know first pay of the month. I just want to process those that are to be paid every pay. That then filters my grid and lists only those that have the pay cycle every pay defined on the payroll item configuration screen. I simply check the box to select all of these payables. It's gonna then move those to the right-hand side and I'm gonna select post. It's gonna ask me then for a, um, a, some information, the date, so maybe I want to make this the pay date. You know, sometimes districts want their checks to be dated um, the same as their uh, pay date. I think our pay date was the 25th. Yeah. Um, it'll ask you for the your bank account by default that, you know, should already be supplied for you. And then we're going to select XML and it will default then to the next starting check number. I'm going to click post. Uh, maybe my date isn't good. Maybe I didn't enter that correctly. Sorry. Okay, so this is going to create a couple additional um, items for us. One is the XML file. So if there are physical checks that we're paying, um, it's going to create that checks.xml file that I would then upload to my third party and my printing software um, to print my checks. It also creates a payables payment report. So this is like the pay dead report in Classic. So it, now it has this, um, a report listing the check number, the payee, who it was made payable to, and then the amount. So I know a lot of districts might, you know, use this report to put in some kind of spreadsheet that they're, you know, they it helps them balance, you know, at the end of the month, the end of the quarter, calendar year, fiscal year, those sorts of things. So this is the report they would want to use for that purpose. Don't get this report mixed up with using the, the payroll item reports that are found within the detail of the payroll. I don't know how many times, you know, when districts first start out, they're using those, um, let me go back and show you what I'm talking about. Payroll, payroll processing, detail. They're using these reports here to use to like call in their electronic payments, okay? That's fine, but if it's a if it's a payable that they're only paying once a month, they're going to need to be using, you know, multiple reports, one from each pay that they processed within that month. So they can use these to balance to their payables payment report, but this is really the report that they want to use when they're you know, making those electronic payments. This is what the system arrived at the payment amount for, you know, this motorist service uh, payable. Okay. If they get, uh, if they would happen to forget to print these payable reports and they've already processed, you know, those, that group of payables, um, they are found in the file archive. So we would go to utilities, file archive. I apologize, the um, file archive is not set up in this test account, but there is um, a payee payment detail um, line. You single click on that, it's gonna open up then all of these reports that we just viewed. The payables detail report, the payable summary report, the payables payment report and even the XML file um, is there if they would need that to reprint um, or for printing purposes. Okay, so they're really not ever lost. Um, I do know that the payables reports that are out in the file archive do not page break um, like we talked about. Um, if you go, 
you know, to those payables reports and check this box. It's just one continuous report. So that is the downside, you know, until that enhancement is released. Um, it's one downside of, you know, maybe forgetting to print those and you need to send something with your check. You might have to manipulate the report a little bit. Okay. All right, are there any questions about outstanding payables? There's just a couple other things that I wanted to talk about um, when we're wrapping things up for today. Um, one, when we're talking about payroll items, um, how easy it is to refund um, a payroll item in the redesign. So in classic, you either had to use a ref screen, you know, if the employee was not going to be paid any longer, um, you would put in that negative um, on, you know, their deduction screen, and then they, you would add that employee using the ref screen option. Um, or you would just, you know, add the error adjustment, and then you would have to wait for the next time you run a payroll for them to be included, and then, you know, the deduction would be refunded to them that way. In the redesign, um, it is super easy to refund a deduction back to an employee and it does not have to be within the, uh, a payroll, okay? So what you need to do is go to that employee's dashboard. We're gonna go to payroll items. And let's say this employee should not have had city tax um, withheld. So we're gonna refund this back to them by clicking on the plus sign under the air adjustments option. And we're gonna, you know, deductions, payroll items are seen as positives to withhold. So to give this back, we're gonna use a negative. So I'm gonna put in a negative $100. And I'm gonna put in the description, moved um, out of city. And you could even put in a date, like maybe 12, you know, 31, 21, something for you to reference back to. We can leave the date blank because we want this to um, be effective, you know, then the process we're going to do next. So we don't want to um, control it. Um, we want it refunded immediately. We're going to click save. I'm going to close out of this. Now there's a, um, an area under processing called payroll item refund. So this is an area now when districts migrate along with, you know, anything you've placed in the air adjustment um, area forward in the redesign, this is where all of those um, air adjustments are housed. So you might notice that when districts first migrate to the redesign, you come out to this area and there could be 50 um, air, you know, uh, air adjustments. And you're like, where did those come from? Well, chances are, if you go back to their classic files, there were air adjustments in their classic files that could have been hanging out there for years. Okay. So if you're doing test imports um, and you come to the refund payroll item area and you see all of those out here, um, it might not be a bad idea to, to have the district look those over and they could clean them up by just removing the error adjustment from that deduction screen record um, prior that, to them going live. Or they can migrate over, no harm done, um, go to this area then, and you can actually, you know, view those refunds here. And my suggestion would be just to click the edit button and you can click the um, trash can and then save it. And that's going to get rid of that payroll item refund from um, the area. So they're, they're, it's going to be clean going forward. Um, there could be several out here that just came over from Classic that they're never going to um, process. So it kind of clutters the screen. So just kind of a, a side note there to um, help you um, when they migrate or once they've migrated, clean this up. 
So now I think our, our gentleman's name was Hearst. So here's then that, pay, that air adjustment that we posted um, for his city tax. So I can find, you know, in this case, I just want to refund Brent back his um, $100 that was withheld in air. Again, I don't have to wait for a payroll to be run. I'm going to click the box on that particular um, air adjustment. I'm going to click refund selected payroll items. I can even create this refund as an ACH payment if I'd like. So I, I don't have to worry about getting a check, you know, mailing a check, the mail gets, it gets lost in the mail. I, if it's, you know, feasible, I can create this as an ACH payment and then upload that to my bank and, and you know, have it direct deposited to him. So the check option looks like this. We're gonna select check. It's gonna ask us for our bank name, which should default. Our starting check number will automatically increment to the next available check number. Um, I can use then a date within my current um, posting month. And then I wanna use XML, my pay plan, bi-weekly. And then this is gonna be the default um, file name. When I process then the XML, or when I process the refund, it's going to create an XML file that I can then upload to my printing software to print and give back this employee their $100. Let's take a look at what it looks like when I switch it to ACH electronic payment. Um, it looks slightly different. You have the issue date, um, the ACH source, the pay plan again, and then this gives you um, the, the file name. I would then process the refund and then upload this file then to my bank to get that direct deposit process. One thing to keep in mind, I had we did have some difficulty with, um, you know, if you're using like today's date and you're, the district is uploading this ACH file to their bank, sometimes they, the bank did, side of things didn't like the date being the same date because they need like, you know, that two day window, so many hour window in order for that payment to be processed. So they'll wanna be conscious of, you know, the date that they use if they are creating an ACH file um, because they might have some issues with it being the same date um, when they go to try to upload that to their bank. I know some banks allow them to change the date on the file when it gets to the bank side. So just something to point out that I know um, did cause some issues. Um, you know, they wanna be conscious of that when they create the file. Other than that, super slick. Like it's, you know, really cool to be able to, um, you know, process those refunds in a couple clicks and then outside the, the payroll process. So now maybe you want to provide something to the employee uh, regarding their refund. Maybe you, you know, you send them, send it via ACH, they have, you know, the money, but it doesn't really help um, in showing the employee the payment, um, what actually happened with the payment. If you would go back to the employee's dashboard and we're gonna go to payments, there's actually another tab um, called refund payments. So if I select that, I can then see this payment that I, this refund payment that I just processed, I'm gonna select that and I'm gonna click detail report. This then provides me a PDF of more information about this employee's check or their payment. Okay. All right. That is refunding payroll items. Um, the very last thing that I wanted to show you, and depending upon you know, the time of the month it is, um, it might may or may not apply. Um, it's probably something that the district is not doing you know, every pay, 
Um, but that is accruing their benefits. So um, well, while, we, while we're here, you know, each employee that's eligible is going to have a leave screen. So I'll just open this here. And you can see here that this employee is eligible for sick and personal leave. Okay, those flags are set. On the position record, so if I go to the employees position record there's a section called eligibility flags and you can see here that they're eligible for personal leave and sick leave, but not vacation. So let's go back to the leave screen sorry a lot of clicking um, you can see here, then these are edit this so you can see it a little better. Um, you know, the information regarding accruing sick leave and accruing or resetting personal leave. Okay. Keep in mind, these values here are super important in order for the employee's balance to be updating correctly. Okay. There has to be a leave unit defined in order for an employee's balance to when you when you run the accrual process in order for these to um, be accruing in their balance to be reflecting the correct value. Okay. All right, so we have, you know, that's how behind the scenes, so, so to speak, how things are working, what the system is looking at. So I'm going to go back to processing and I'm going to go to benefit update and projection. So there's several tabs here. Really, the two we're going to talk about are the accrual and the reset personal leave. OK, um, accrual, probably something maybe the districts are doing every month. Um, they're probably accruing um, their sick leave. Some districts even accrue vacation. OK, some reset their or only post, you know, vacation at once a year. Um, so it really depends on, again, how the negotiated agreement works. You know, each district is set up, could be set up a little differently. But the very first thing we want to do is we just want to generate a, a report um, for us to look at and make sure that it's going to, it's accurate before we actually post, in this case, sick leave. Okay. So you can give this report a title. So maybe, um, you know, I know a lot of times districts print these reports off and they actually keep them in a binder. So maybe, you know, this is for um, the month of February. Um, we accrue, you know, at the beginning of the month for the month prior. So you could be putting in February, 2022. Again, we want to make sure that this says projection. And then based on each district's um, you know, how they're accruing their leave, you can be accruing leave, um, you know, in one step. So if they're a district that does accrue sick and vacation, they have the means to do that. If they'd like to do them separately, they can do that. If they want to accrue all leave types, um, they can do that. So it kind of is district specific as far as you know, what works best for them. They're gonna put in a, an accrual date. Let's just use, um, I'm gonna use 3-1-22. Don't think that they're probably going to want to include in, ineligible positions, but if that's something that applies to that district, they can certainly check the box. And then how do you want um, the, imp the report sorted? I'm gonna go with name. I feel like that's easier for me to, to look through. By default, if nothing is selected in the pay groups or employees, then everybody is selected, okay? Um, again, going back to you know larger districts, they may only be working with certain pay groups, maybe just certified, maybe just classified. So you know if that applies to that you know specific district, they have the means to select specific pay groups. Um, and accrue the benefits that way. I'm going to go down then. This is set to projection. So I want to generate the report. 
And again, I'm just accruing sick leave. So this is gonna give me a report then of what their balance was, what it's gonna accrue, and then what their new balance will be. So the district obviously would want to look through this report, verify everything's okay. And then if they're satisfied, all they should need to do is change this to the accrual report. My, my date's good. Um, and then they're going to click generate report again. And this is going to go out then and accrue the leave for all of those employees that we just looked at and increase their balance to be what's in the, the new sick leave balance field. Okay. Pretty, very, very similar to like Ben, um, Benac, B-E-N-A-C-C -E in classic, not much difference. Um, there is the reset personal leave option as well. So most generally, you know, this is happening um, towards the beginning of the school year. So probably not something that districts are doing now, but if they would need to, again, just make sure that the first time they um, are accessing this option that it says projection, they're gonna enter the specific accrual date and then they can sort the report then by name or number and then include you know, specific pay groups um, in this uh, report if, if needed. I'll give you a look, of, see what this looks like. Very similar to the report we just looked at, except now instead of accruing, we're actually resetting. So if somebody has a balance, it's going to zero out that balance and then reset um, the, the new balance to whatever the reset value was on the leave screen that we just looked at. Okay, so it doesn't accrue, it doesn't add to the existing balance, it overrides it and makes it whatever that reset value is um, on the individual employee's leave screen. Okay. So if I go back to, let's go back, I'm thinking he might be one that accrued. Um, if I go back to this employee's uh, leave screen, there's an accumulations tab. So this can be helpful in seeing, you know, hey, did I miss accruing leave for um, somebody for a month? You know, if, if they're questioning their balance, um, this is an easy way to um, sort of see, you know, in one spot what happened for this employee. Maybe I'm really just, um, you know, worried about sick leave. I could filter this by the type of sick, and then I could even create a report, um, you know, in maybe Excel. So I'm going to use Excel data. And then I'm going to generate this report, and that will allow me maybe to do some totaling, you know, uh, look at it that way. Or if I just need a pretty version to give, you know, give to a principal or something, um, I could use the PDF version. Um, it might be helpful in, you know, filtering it by date. Maybe we're just looking at like the fiscal year. I didn't think about that until just now. So we might want to filter it by you know, from the beginning of the year and there, yeah. So this would give us a report then for just this fiscal year, which they're probably looking at a time frame. I would assume. Okay. All right. Let me look over, make sure I went through everything I was supposed to here. I feel like I did. Um, does anybody have any questions? I know that was a lot of information to go over in three short hours, um, but I'd be happy to answer or revisit something that um, you guys had questions on.
Okay. All right. Well, um, I hope you guys found it helpful. Um, and hopefully, you know, you picked up some things that maybe um, you can, you know, pass along to, to your districts. Um, it was great meeting with all of you this morning. Um, I'm so excited to be back with SSDT. And unfortunately, you're probably going to get to hear from me <laughs> more in the future. So um, again, thank you for your time this morning. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Bye. Thank you.